Good evening, good evening. good evening. All right, it's good to see you all, and I'm glad that so many of you have made it out back to our last evening program for this camp meeting. It's good to see you all here. Welcome back to be able to join hands together in amplifying the gospel. Oh, uh, let's give me that. I want to acknowledge that we have a, a, a section here just for angels. So don't take those seats. They're, angels are with us tonight. Now, welcome to this evening's program. And my role tonight is to tell you about breakfast tomorrow. Did you know breakfast is on the house tomorrow? Uh, whoop, whoop, yo. Breakfast is on the house tomorrow. All right. And where? Who knows where? Over at the Nature Center is where you get free breakfast. Now, you'll notice that the menu has some very creative Nature Center names, some with furry names attached to them. And there might even be some furry things there to see, including something with four paws. <laughs> and it's very cute and very small. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I, it's just the cutest thing you could ever imagine. So come for breakfast tomorrow. 8 o'clock at the Nature Center. And at the Nature Center at breakfast, we have a special group, special guest artists, musical guest artists, the Chitons. They will be singing and playing the steel pan drums. So come join us. All right, so we are going to enjoy our last service today. And we are ready to listen to Pastor Williams again as he closes our uh, can meeting portion of the preaching of the word in the afternoon. So it is our pleasure to um, be here, be back here again, and let us give Pastor William the opportunity to open the word again and speak to our hearts. So let us worship together one more time before activities, because we do have prepared a lot of activities for us to enjoy after the service. And with that, I want to pray, asking the Lord for his presence during our service this afternoon. Dear Father, we invite you, Lord, to be here with us. Give us your Holy Spirit. Give us your presence. And Father, reveal to your church in the direction that we must walk, and we will follow you, Lord. We also bring to you, Lord, Pastor Williams, Elder Williams, as he opens the word uh, to us one more time during this weekend. And we pray, Lord, that we can hear your voice, that we can feel your presence, and that we can see in which direction you want us to, to go. And again, Father, we will follow you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Video's going. We're here live in Greeley, Colorado, just north of Denver. I'm here with Calvin Brooks, who helps with Pathfinders across the state, Merlin Brooks, who's PBE director. She directs Pathfinder clubs and Pathfinder Bible experience for the whole conference of Florida. And I'm Pedro Perez. We're here, you can tell in, in Colorado, got a surprise this morning, it snowed. But the best thing about today is our clubs have been at the NAD level, North American Division. We have 12 clubs. We're gonna put a list on the screen so you see how those clubs did today, what placement they got. We're proud of all our teams. Thank you for your prayers and support. And thank you for believing in Pathfinders and our young people in the Florida Conference. Hi, everyone. Hi, Florida Conference Camp Meeting. We are here with our Pathfinder. We are so proud of them. We just want to praise God for them. Hello, everyone. All right, that was Pastor Perez in Coles, Colorado. You saw the snow in the background. And I promised I would give you an update as to where the placements were. And generally speaking, um, the placements are in categories. There's a first place category. That means multiple teams can be, in, can be in each category. There's a first place category, a second place category, and a third place category. Um, I have some good news and some bad news. 
What news do you want to hear first? I heard good, I heard bad. I'm going to tell you the bad news. I'm going to tell you the bad news. There were 150, 150 teams participating today. And as a matter of fact, four teams came from Cuba, right, to participate. The bad news is it was not good for many of the teams. Florida had 12 teams, and all 12 got first place. <laughs> <laughs> it was a clean sweep. <laughs> Praise God, all 12 te teams, are, teams are on the board right now. There's a list. Palm Coast, Forest Lake, South Brevard had two teams. Eliotha, Fort Lauderdale Spanish, Lehigh Acres, Maranatha, Miami Central Spanish, Spring Hill Spanish, Tampa First, and Westchester Spanish. Put your hands together for these teams once more. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Listen, listen, listen. Also, also, we started a, 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 a similar, a similar, comp well, not competition, but a similar thing for adventurers. Called, it's called the Adventurer Bible Game. Adventurer Bible Game. Those teams consist of adventurers and their parents. Adventurers and parents all. Teams. And this year, we went to the state level. That was the highest level. We had seven teams uh, making it to the state level, and three teams received first place. There was uh, Miami Central, no, Miami Central, no, sorry, Miami Springs, Miami Springs, Tampa Spanish, and uh, Northwest Day, the Northwest Day Church. So those three teams received first place. But for the PBE, all 12 teams first place. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Welcome. We'd love it if you'd stand and sing with us. Uh, we've been so happy and thankful to be here to worship together with you. Let's lift up our voices and praise to our Father in heaven.
That's why I trust in myself, the Lord. And he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath, Lord, in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for singing and worshiping with us. Please have a seat. Good evening once again. Okay. So we are here just to share with you um, some of the news that we have received from those that have been counting the offerings that you have been given us. And before we share that, I want to hear from Teresa. She has an amazing story of one of the recipients, from one of the recipients of the scholarship last year. Teresa, why don't you share more with us? Yeah, so I was sharing with Elisa, and I, I'm excited to share with you guys what your gifts have been doing for our kids. There's a young lady that came uh, last year. She'd been coming to camp multiple years in the past. Last year, her mom reached out and said, hey, we've hit some hard times. Is there anything the camp has? And I said, yes, we have a worthy camper scholarship. So she applied. This young lady, for the first time ever, came on a scholarship. She'd been at camp before. She came into her cabin. She built this community. She, as you heard from the young lady this morning, she left home. She left the distractions of the world, the, the trials, the things that are pulling our youth um, side to side and she came to summer camp and she'd had this experience before but this year was the year that God was gonna knock on her heart just a little bit louder she came to camp she found herself grounded in who Christ was telling her she was as a young lady in Jesus she was baptized that Sabbath she was one of our four at summer amen. camp amen. that was Can baptized amen that? as a worthy camper scholarship kid it got better I would have never known this story had her mom not come up to me and told me really what was going on. Her mom came up and she said, I have to tell you, my daughter is different today. And I said, well, what does that mean? My daughter is the child that I want her to be in Christ. She is grounded in Jesus. She knows who she is. Her interactions with her friends are different. Um, who she is exuding is different because of summer camp. So thank you to the Worthy Camper Scholarship. Thank you to those who give because that young lady needed to be here at camp last summer. Amen. 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 Praise God, yes. Thank God. Thank you, Teresa, for sharing. And Phil, why don't you tell us some news in regards to the offerings? And so, I'll share something else that I just heard. That you just heard? Five seconds ago. Okay. All right, I have to go first. <laughs> yes. Okay. So anyway, so... What was our final number? So our final number before five seconds ago was just over $3,500. Okay. Now remember, we have a, what is it, a donor's a match? A donor to match up to 10000 Up to, to 10000 10, 10, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we're really, we're getting there. We're getting close. And then I just heard 10 seconds ago now that we just received a thousand dollar pledge praise god praise god for that so that yeah. makes it over forty five hundred dollars over forty five hundred dollars so thus far we still have this evening's offering call 
So what does that make it for the number of campers that can come next summer from what so we, have? we So we do usually you said about a 50% match, right? Yeah. Or 50% yes. sponsorship. Yes, we want to be diligent with the gifts that we're given. So we do 50%. And we want to stretch those dollars to as many campers as possible. So with the 3,500 mark, that gave us about 26 kids that could be sponsored. 26 kids. Now wouldn't we, it be great? Wouldn't it be great if we could sponsor 40 kids? 40 kids. I'll tell you what, this is better than the stock market. <laughs> we got people who are, we got a donor that's going to match it. And I hate to lose this, Teresa. I hate you. to lose this. Wouldn't it be great if we could sponsor 40 kids? And I believe we could get there tonight. I believe, let's dig deep and get 40 kids here and let some more kids come to know Jesus as their Savior. Amen. So we will have those various ways to give. You see on the screen, give.floridaconference.com. There's also Adventist Giving. There's also PayPal. And there's also the number that is also on the screen that you can text CAMP to and give your donation, your offering, as God leads, as God impresses. We just request that you prayerfully consider how to help those young people. Let me have a word of prayer for us. Amen. Dear Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for where we are thus far with the offerings that have been received for your children to come to summer camp. We thank yeah. you for those that have sacrificed, those that have given, those that have prayed, yeah. Lord. Yeah. We thank you, we thank you. We ask, Father, that you will continue to bless us. We are blessed when we give. We are blessed because we give. We just ask for your continual blessings and for the, mo the money, the funds that will be connected tonight, we ask that you will bless it mm -hmm. and stretch it as far and wide as you can. Yeah. We ask all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless Amen. you. Thank you.
Well, good evening, everybody. You all have hung all day, and it's been a wonderful Sabbath. Can you say amen? amen. And it's a joy to be able to close the Sabbath with you this evening. And uh, I came in with a white shirt and a tie. Now I'm a part of the family. I thank God for Amplify. I thank God for your leadership team, Elder Machado and uh, Alicia, has been uh, just wonderful hosts for us. And I want to thank God for them and their ministry and their attention to detail, not just to Kathleen and I, but to each of you. And I praise the Lord that as the sun is setting, we can close the Sabbath together. I've got news for us. We're all candidates for the cemetery without the privilege of cancellation. Except we know someone who holds the keys to hell, death, and the grave. And I want to talk about that for a few moments as we close this evening. Shall we pray? Lord, what a privilege we've had to open your word and to walk with you through the pages of Scripture. Tonight is no different. Your people have been faithful all day, and this Sabbath has been uplifting, encouraging, and a blessing. As we close the Sabbath, Lord, in your word, I pray that it will charge us through the week to live for Jesus. This is my prayer as we amplify the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Bibles tell us something in Luke 24, and I want to read a few verses from Luke 24, a familiar story of two disciples who meet Jesus along life's path. And verse 13 begins our journey with these two. Now behold, two of them, how many of them, everybody? Were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus. What was the name of the village? Which was seven miles from Jerusalem. How many miles? Remember, I'm a seven-mile marathoner. Seven miles. Don't forget that. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained. Some versions say they did not recognize him. So they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is it that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Let's walk with these two disciples. First of all, they leave the western gate of Jerusalem and they are discussing their reversal. The Bible says they're walking seven miles. How many of you walk in the morning or the evening or sometime during the day? I walked two miles this morning here at Camp Kalakwa. And don't judge me, I think it would take me about two and a half hours to do seven miles. Some of you walk much faster. But they're walking and they're talking. The Bible names one as Cleopas, but the other disciple doesn't have a name and remains nameless today. And they're walking and they're discussing their issues of disappointment. And as they're walking, I believe they're throwing their own self-catered pity party. 
You ever been there? Did life ever come at you and you, <laughs> what's the purpose? And ultimately, as they deal with their disappointment, because everything died when Rabbi Yeshua died on Calvary's cross. All of their hopes and dreams were put in him. And when he allowed them, so they thought, to crucify him, everything was crucified with Jesus. Their tomorrows, their dreams. And all they could find themselves thinking about was failure. And the Bible says, as they were discussing their demise, and as they're dealing with their issues, get it, they're on the Emmaus Road walking seven miles, and Jesus joins these two brothers and Jesus joins them, and he joins them on their seven-mile path. Oh, my goodness. But they don't recognize that it's Jesus. And the Bible says, when Jesus joined them in their depression, he asked them a question. He says, why are you sad? We just read it. First of all, aren't you glad the Lord knows when we're sad? Aren't you glad that he digs down into the emotions of our everyday events and asks pinpointed questions? And these disciples got a little indignant. Man, don't you know? Read the story when you get home. Don't you know what happened? Why are you asking? Didn't you know that Jesus was crucified and he died? And now we don't know what we're going to do. Why does God ask us questions when he already knows the answers? Why would God ask Adam and Eve, where are you? <laughs> Only two people on the planet. <laughs> Where are you, Adam? Not that Adam needed to tell God where he was or Eve, but that they could register their journey away from him and realize that they have walked away from the path that he led them in. And so the Bible tells us these two disciples now have Jesus in their midst, and they don't even know he's with them. I believe they were traumatized. It was a traumatic event to see somebody crucified. It was literally indescribable. And what they just experienced was traumatic and these two disciples are thinking that it doesn't make any sense to go forward. He was the one who handled the Pharisees like they were his students. They saw the demolition specialist tear up a man's roof to lower him down so that Jesus could heal the man. And they saw it and they experienced it. And now... He's dead. And the question comes when you are in life's issues and going through stuff, the devil would eke in our consciousness the question, where is God? Where is God when life hurts? Where is God when things get rough? Or when we've counted on something or person and we become despondent and discouraged and desperate. And in their pursuit to find this gut-wrenching meaning, they're leaving Jerusalem, talking about a hot subject, going to a city of warm baths called Emmaus. They're afraid. The other disciples are locked in Jerusalem. I'm going somewhere. And this question comes, where is God when it hurts. 
And yet sealed in their grief, they heard that Mary saw an empty tomb and that Peter had gone there too. And the scripture tells us that Jesus showed up in their midst. I can't pass that by this evening. I want you all to know when you deal with life's issues and they smack you in the face and they confront us and they, they, they ratchet up a need for faith or faithlessness, it is that time that God shows up in your life. He is closest when we are most in need of him. Can you say amen? How do I know? I look at his track record. He showed up in the plains of Mamre with Abraham. He joined the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. He came as a one center meter embryo in Mary's fallopian tubes when the, when the world needed him most. And when we doubt and despair and become disillusioned, that's when Jesus shows up just when we need him. Do I have a witness that he showed up in your life? We can't make up these things. These two disciples are sad. They've heard the report that the tomb is empty. So why are they still sad? It was a great day when creation's morning sang and the sons of God shouted for joy. It was a great day when Israel marched around <laughs> that great wall, Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. It was a great day when David refused to wear Saul's armor, and he took the stones and the sling, and he killed Goliath. It was a great day when Jonah finally decided to preach after his residential stay in Motel Fish. It was a great day when the angelic choir sang, Glory to God in the highest, peace, goodwill towards men. There have been a lot of great days in our lives, but Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ be not raised, we are yet in our sins and our faith is vain. Can you say amen? We serve a risen Savior who's in the world today, no matter what people may say. So the Lord is walking with them. He's dealing with their self occupation, their self-preservation, and their self-medication. They're disappointed. They can't believe what they went through, and Jesus joins them. The Lord shows up, and I need you all to understand this. Sometimes we think the Holy Spirit has to fall in pristine quietness and pristine situations. The Holy Spirit shows up in mess. The Holy Spirit convicts when the sun is in the pig's pen. The Holy Spirit goes into bars and he brings about a, a conscious decision that they're not going to take another drink. The Holy Spirit walks in clubs and brings former children back home again. When I grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist, I was told that God doesn't go certain places. That is a lie. I want you all to know God will go anywhere to save his children. And the issue for us is not relegating God to a, a special place with a special thing. God is about salvation, and he will reach into the uttermost to save us. Yes, we all have an Emmaus road. And the gospel reality is found in these three things that I want to share, and then we'll be done. The first reality is, is that Jesus doesn't just show us how to walk, but he walks with us. Aren't you glad that we don't serve a God who's just a way up there God? 
but he put on our flesh. He breathed our air. He died our death. And he lived our life so that we can live with him forever. He's a God that I will serve the rest of my life and have served for many years of our lives. And he knew we would be quick to say, well, Lord, you haven't put on my size 12s or you haven't walked in my size 7 shoes. So Jesus came to live, and I love what Paul says. We have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Jesus gets on the feeling level with us. And he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. And then Paul says, let us go boldly to the throne of grace. Hallelujah. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I'm so glad Jesus is intimately concerned with every detail of our lives. He gave us a fingerprint that nobody else has. He numbers the hairs on our head. And if you have no more hair, he knew how many you used to have. He's a personal God, and he cares for us. And we're special to him. He knew us before we were in our mother's womb. And he is a personal God who died for us individually so that we each can be saved in his kingdom. He walks with us. When you're having your worst church board meeting, Jesus walks with us. When you're going through a divorce, Jesus doesn't leave you alone. He walks with you. He is a personal God who's concerned about your sunrise and your sunset called life. He shows up when ministry is not pretty. And he celebrates when we have victories in our lives. And he, thank, he talks to his father about us as he prayed for Peter. Aren't you glad that Jesus prays for us? He shows up. The second reality this evening, as we think about him walking with these men, is that power does not come just by professing him. Power comes when we talk with him. You see, this thing is about a relationship, about a what, everybody? About a what, everybody? A relationship. And, and hear me, I am a professional talker. And I praise God that when I talk, I'm talking scripture, and I'm talking hope, and I'm talking good news, and there is power in that, but the real power is getting to know Jesus yourself and myself for him to know me and for me to know him. And the power is in the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? Not in position, not in your pontification, and the world is waiting on this power the world is waiting to see a people who live out what they preach about and what they believe. Bickering and quarreling and criticism has slain its ten thousands. And God didn't send the Holy Spirit just to thrill and chill us. He sent the Holy Spirit to convict us and to lead and guide us into all truth. And I thank God today that he saves and he speaks to us on a personal level. I read the American Psychiatric Association uh, Diagnostical Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And you all know there are about 300 different supposedly mental disorders. And they're all in the church. The book had the nerve to call high
hyperactivity disorder a mental illness? <laughs> my mom had a real way of curing my brother and my hyperactivity disorder. Back in the day, and I know this is streamed and this is going to be recorded, but back in the day, she had something that was made out of leather. <laughs> and it really helped to... <laughs> we became less hyper, I'll put it that way. <laughs> and as we think about the journey of life, whether it's generational tendencies, whether it's hereditary issues, whether it's my great-great-grandfather's issue that I have four generations later, Jesus is concerned about walking with us on our Florida Emmaus Road. And he's concerned about breaking the cycles that bind us. And he wants to save us even in our journeys of disappointment. And I'm so glad today that we can talk to him. And that's where the power comes. We can pray, not necessarily having to stop and kneel every moment, but we can walk and live in a conscious state of prayer. Amen, somebody. We can talk to the Father. The old song says, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faintest cry. He will answer by and by. Our last reality today is why didn't Jesus tell these men who he was? I mean, for two and a half hours, they're walking and Jesus doesn't tell them who he is and that he's alive. My goodness. Why doesn't the Lord always give us microwavable help? This is, this is real to me. It's because he wanted to send these brothers back to the Bible. You see, they, they thought they knew all about him and they had experienced the blessings, but these men were, were looking for a miracle to happen and Jesus didn't perform a miracle to give them an answer. He didn't relieve their pressure. Desire of Ages tells us that he wanted them to search. Desire of Ages, page 799. He performed no miracle to convince them, but it was his first work to explain the scriptures. And truth must not only take a firm root in people's hearts, but it must be evidence that it's from the word of God. Listen, she wrote seven, uh, page 799, the miracles of Christ are proof of his divinity, yes, but a stronger proof that he is the world's redeemer is found in comparing the prophecies of the Old and the New Testaments. Testimony will encourage you, but the word will keep you. Testimonies are a blessing, but God's word gives us staying power. He walked in Emmaus, and yes, he can walk in Tampa, and he can walk in Miami, and he can walk in your path and on your Emmaus road. And I'm so glad tonight that Jesus chooses to get down and walk with us. He is a relatable Savior. He cares for us. And I give God the praise today that he not only relates, but he understands and he feels and he knows just what we're going through. And I believe that's why heaven is going to be such a rapturous eternal experience because we're going to look over our lives and understand we overcame by the blood of the Lamb. 
And I want you all to know today that Jesus is an Emmaus walking God because he wants to prove to us that he cares. He is a risen Savior in the world today, whatever men may say. Muhammad, considered the last prophet of Israel, of Islam, he died June 8th. 1632. Sun Young Moon, the founder of the Unification Church, claimed to be the Messiah. He married a lot of people, but he died September 3, 2012. Joseph Smith, the prophetic founder of the Latter-day Saint movement, died June 27, 1844. They call him the Pope, the Pope, the vicar of the Son of God. But we know popes do die. Mary, the mother of Jesus, whom some people worship today, we know that she died. Siddhartha, Guatama, Buddha, from the Indian subcontinent on whose teaching of Buddhism are founded, he's dead. Harry Krishna, a mantra of original consciousness, had to realize that when you're dead, you have no consciousness. There was a man in a town when I left the seminary called Reverend Ike. And he was a good friends with another guy named Bishop Charles Manuel Sweet Daddy Grace. <laughs> He started the United House of Prayer for all people. And unfortunately, people worshipped him as a pastor. But y'all, guess what? He died. He's dead. And I want you all to know that Jesus also died, but he's the only one that came back from the grave who has the keys to the hell, death, and we will be put six feet under if we live long enough. And Jesus tarries. But that's not the end of the story. If they put you down in the ground, just know the dead in Christ will hear his voice. And we'll get up. Can you say amen? amen. My mother died some three years ago. And I whispered in her ear the night before she passed, I told her she, she suffered from um, lymphedema in her legs and she had been bedridden for three years. And I came five days before she passed in California and I saw the struggle and I told her, I said, Mom, it's okay to rest. And she died the next morning. I look forward to seeing my mother again. My father-in-law, my wife's dad, he passed. He had Alzheimer, an aggressive Alzheimer that took his life. I look forward to seeing him again. And Jesus is our only hope out of here, y'all. He's our only help in here, y'all. And he wants to save us. And he wants us to know that eternity is ours. We just have to accept it by faith. As I close and our praise team comes to sing, draw me nearer, 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 precious Lord. I love what Solomon said at the end of his life. Man, when you read Solomon's testimony, it's a record of blingonomics. 1 Kings 10, Solomon had 25 tons of gold. He had a throne of ivory, golden goblets. 1 Kings 4, 22, he had 10,000 people working for him in his palace. 1 Kings 11, 1 through 3, the man had the nerve to have 700 wives and 300 concubines. 1 Kings 4.26, he 
He had 4,000 stalls plus chariots and 10,000 horses. Solomon didn't lack anything. Ecclesiastes 2, 4 through 7 said he had acres and lands and palaces and dams and orchards. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 says he tried all of the pleasures of life. He had more books and understood them more than you and I could ever imagine. And at the end of his life, he says, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Here is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of us. That's it, y'all. Simply to love God and to love one another. Are you in the pursuit of stuff? Has discouragement dislodged you from understanding that Jesus is walking with you in your valley? I'm here to encourage you today that he cares for you. And as we sing this song, Draw Me Nearer, draw me nearer as we close at least this phase of camp meeting tonight. When we leave these grounds, only you can answer whether it's been worth the trip to be here. Some of you drove and some of you flew and some of you spent the night and others of you didn't. But we want to be drawn closer to him. Would you stand as we sing a stanza of this song? Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross. Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, yes. nearer blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. One more time. You sound beautiful this evening. Draw me nearer, nearer blessed Lord. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed with me. Lord, this is a crazy Emmaus road sometimes. It's filled with ups and downs in the river and on the bank, joys and sorrows. Thank you for not leaving us hopeless. Thank you for walking with us on this journey. And thank you for being a God who cares so much about us that you enter into the plight of our journey. Lord, you didn't have to come, but you showed us you loved us. And you came to take our place and die our death. We just want to say thank you tonight. And may that spur us on. May that encourage us. May, may that give us, give us um, impetus to keep on going one more day. Draw us nearer to you, Lord. And I pray that you will lead us to a, to a relationship that will be such a blessing 
that others will want to know when we have setbacks and challenges and trials and we still smile. Lord, I pray that others will want to know the God of our relationship. So, Lord, today, take our hearts and accept us. Thank you for being a God of grace and of love and of mercy. And we ask that you will bless your people here in the Florida Conference and use this community to tear down Satan's kingdom. In Jesus' name, let everybody say amen and amen. It's been a joy being with you. God bless you. We'll take back the word to the North American Division, Elder Machado, that Florida is on fire. God bless you. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart, and you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you.
righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. Some good news in regards to the offerings that we received this weekend from you. So we received additional pledges, um, one being for 10 kids for over $2,600, and we received offerings tonight that have brought us up to the $10,000. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. Many kids will be impacted for the kingdom, for eternity, because of what you did, what you gave, how you prayed, and how you have supported. Thank you.